There have been some truly wild things that people have fought about in New York City's history. In today's story, we're going to learn why a fight over Shakespeare left at least 22 people dead. Let's get into it. It feels like theater has always had a big role in New York City. And that was true in the mid-19th century as well. In 1847, the Astor Place Opera House opened with an opera from Verdi. This opera house was trying to attract a certain kind of clientele, the upper crust of Manhattan. So they figured, let's attach John Jacob Astor's name to the building. One of the wealthiest men in world history. He was America's first multimillionaire. And this building was decked out with tall pillars, with upholstered seats, and you weren't allowed entry into the building unless you had gloves. All of the wealthy people would sit in these balconies above the stage, that way you could get a proper view of everything, and then there were cheap benches down below for the lower class. Now, seating for the lower class was scarce. The Opera House wasn't interested in having lower class people come to see their shows because they were often associated with rowdiness and the Astor Place Opera House was trying to give off this illusion that that kind of thing didn't happen here. Now at this time, a lot of the big stage actors came from overseas. There weren't that many American actors who had found success. However, one of the few that did was a man named Edwin Forrest, despite everything his hair was trying to do to sabotage him. Now Forrest had quite the bizarre introduction into acting. When he was only 14 years old, he had attended a lecture where they were testing the effects of nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, and he volunteered to participate in this experiment. Now, while under the influence of the gas, he randomly broke into a soliloquy from Shakespeare's Richard III. Impress somebody, and that person would convince him, hey, you should go audition for some stuff. He found some moderate success when he was in his early 20s, But then he started a playwriting contest, and he'd get submissions from all over the place. The only rule for the contest? I get to play the lead role. This somehow worked for him, and he was able to launch a successful career from this. He did it for about 20 years. However, Forrest still wasn't having the same kind of success that big-name British actors were having. One of those British actors was a man named William McCready. Forrest? Very aware of McCready. They weren't exactly friendly with one another, although I guess it depends on who you asked. Like if you had read MacReady's diary, first off, shame on you. But second, you would have seen that MacReady had no ill intentions when it came to Forrest. He wrote about it. But the American actor did not feel the same way. Forrest had tried to play his hand with foreign audiences, notably in Britain, but both the press and audiences were unkind to him. And for whatever reason, Forrest was convinced that this was either A, because he was American, or B, McCready was behind it somehow. Then McCready went and performed in the same exact show, but got rave reviews out in Edinburgh. So, Forrest, being the jealous man that he was, went to Edinburgh, joined one of these audiences, and started booing and hissing from the crowd. A rivalry had formed, and everybody knew about it. Fast forward to 1849. The Astor Place Opera House is getting set to begin performances of Shakespeare's Macbeth, but they are looking for somebody to fill the title role. McCready was touring the United States at this point, and the Astor Place Opera House said, you know what? I think we want the British actor. So they asked him, and he agreed to do a four-week engagement beginning on May 7th. Now, under normal circumstances, this would have devastated Edwin Forrest, but... The Broadway Theater, which was about a mile south of the Astor Place Opera House, they were also going to put on Macbeth at the same exact time, and they wanted him in the title role. So now the question is, who is going to do it better? Now remember, this is a different era. Most theatergoers are wealthy, but what percentage of American people are wealthy? And do their opinions really represent how citizens feel about this rivalry? What about the generation that fought in the War of 1812? What about the Americans who see all these revolutions sweeping across Europe in 1848, thinking to themselves, why do the British still have Queen Victoria? So the average Joes of America decided, let's weigh in on this acting rivalry. Let's fast forward to May 7. It's opening night of Macbeth at the Astor Place Opera House. One of the managers there, William Niblo, has accidentally given out too many tickets for the show. Yeah, apparently more than the typical opera crowd was interested in seeing this British interpretation of Macbeth. So William Niblo contacted the police and said, look, I accidentally handed out too many tickets. 
is it possible that I could get a little bit of a police presence here? Because there's a chance it might get a little rowdy. When the police showed up, they saw how many people were there, and yeah, it was a little chaotic, but nobody was doing anything wrong. Once they opened the doors to the public, everybody raced inside, and it got packed quickly. People were squished into the cheap benches, people are standing in the aisles, and they're propped up against the stage. I mean, this place is packed. There's not much wiggle room for anybody. The people at the front of the house started looking up to the rafters, making eye contact with people, nodding like, okay, it's about to go down. But no one really knew what was happening. They just kind of had a sense that there was something going on. Now, it all began with an old tradition that we don't really do in theater anymore. But right before curtain, everyone in the audience would start to stomp their feet on the ground, and it would give off this thunderous sound like the audience could build up anticipation. Hey, the show's about to start. And then once the curtain went up, people are supposed to stop stomping their feet. That way they can pay attention to the show. But on this night, that's not what happened. The thunderous stomping only got louder and louder throughout the night. Maybe it started a little subtly, but by the time William McCready finally stepped out onto stage, first, he was met with great applause and cheering from the elites in the balcony section. But once they started to die down, the rest of the crowd took over. And we're not talking just stomping, we're talking about hecklers, hissers, and catcallers, whatever you want to call them, interruptions. And it was loud. McCready attempted to get through the scene, but there's not a chance that anyone in the audience heard a single word that he said. Now for those of you that don't know Macbeth, he's not in the first couple of scenes. So I don't know exactly what happened in those first couple scenes, but when the Brit finally stepped on stage, play was over. And he tried, he tried to fight through this, he figured, Oh, once Lady Macbeth comes on stage, everyone will be kind to her because she's a woman. But that's not what happened. In fact, she got it worse. She ran off the stage. Now, for whatever reason, McCready attempted to go back out onto the stage, and he was met with rotten eggs and potatoes and chairs. People were literally throwing chairs onto the stage. So, fearing for his own safety, he left the stage, the curtain dropped, and that was it. Good night, everybody. It was like Americans had won the night. Now, the managers tried to convince McCready to continue his run, regardless of this snafu, and he's thinking, Blimey, are you bloody mad? But somehow, they were able to persuade him after a petition was signed by people like Washington Irving and Herman Melville, two of the more famous authors in American history. So he was talked into going on stage again on May 10th, or three days later. This would directly compete with Edwin Forrest's performance of Macbeth at the Broadway theater. English haters ended up putting up their own signs, like this one that reads, Working men, shall Americans or English rule in this city? The crew of the British steamer have threatened all Americans who shall dare to offer their opinions this night at the English aristocratic opera house. Working men, free men, stand up to your lawful rights. Now there was a new mayor at the time. His name was Caleb Woodhull. And by new, I mean he became mayor the day after McCready's opening night at the Astor Place Opera House. Now he's no fool. He knows what happened over there. So, after seeing some of these posters around the city, he started to freak out a little bit. So the mayor calls into his office the police chief, the sheriff, the co-managers of the theater, and even Major General Charles Sanford, the commander of the National Guard's 7th Regiment. A little over 300 police officers were present at the opera house. Meanwhile, General Sanford had a matching set of men at the Washington Parade Ground, which we now call Washington Square Park. Now, McCready tried to pack the house with people that he knew, people that were supporters instead of these ruffians. However, once again, the house was over capacity. When he came out, Act 1, Scene 3, and said, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. Mm, nobody heard him. Once again, the noise is unbearable, and audiences can't hear anything the stage actors are saying. The police are in the theater. In fact, the police chief is in one of the luxury boxes. But all the police were told, don't do anything unless the chief gives the signal. When the second act began, the crowd that was outside of the theater, they start hurling bricks and heavy stones through all of the boarded windows at the opera house. Street lamps were broken, fire hydrants were opened. The police tried to counterattack, but they are severely outnumbered. There's only 300 of them versus a mob of 10,000 people. After an hour goes by, Militia men finally started to join the fray. For whatever reason, the mayor thought it would be a good idea to barrel his way through the crowds and into the opera house. That way he could talk to the police chief about what they could do next. But when he did that, 
he gave them every opportunity to start battering down the doors. A militia officer begged the mayor, please let us fire into the crowd. And the mayor said, what are you, crazy? Let me leave first. It wasn't until the mayor left and the show was over and McCready was safe in his dressing room that they finally got the order. The soldiers were disgusted that they had been ordered to fire at the same people that they had sworn to protect. So instead, they started to fire above the crowd's heads to try to scare them, but they didn't. One man even shouted, you wouldn't dare fire at an American to protect the life of a British actor. But that was the next order. Shots were fired into the crowd, killing 22 people that night and an additional nine over the few days that followed. Over 200 militiamen and police officers were injured in the riot, along with another 48 on the side of the rioters. The riot resulted in the largest number of civilian casualties due to military action in the United States since the American Revolutionary War. The theater's reputation was forever tainted. In fact, people stopped calling it the Astor House and started calling it the Disaster House. Did they try to run for a few more seasons? Yeah, but it was no use. They eventually sold the building and it was later renamed Clinton Hall. In 1890, the building was torn down and replaced with a new building, also called Clinton Hall. It still stands today. You can find it on Lafayette Street between East 8th Street and Astor Place. Edwin Forrest tried to continue acting, but his life got turned upside down when he got caught having an affair with another actress. And that led to a messy divorce. As for the British actor William McCready, he retired from acting two years later. So that's going to do it. Remember, I'm Mike, the NYC Storyteller. I want to thank you for coming on by today. Please like, subscribe, and hey, leave a comment. Let me know, do you have a rivalry? What would this riot have been about if we were talking about your rivalry? I really need to come up with better questions for comment sections. <laughs>